Hey guys, it's John Tilly from Zonguru here in Los Angeles and welcome to another episode of Amazon Seller Insights. This is a series where we interview sellers and experts uh, and we're really here just to learn from them, to hear from them, to be inspired by them and use it to fuel our own Amazon business. This is episode 20 uh, and actually it's the first one we're doing as a virtual um, series and I'm super excited to have Jana Krikic all the way over from Serbia with us today. So welcome, Jana. Hi, John. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you. So Jana is the founder of YLT Translations uh, Services and uh, her and her team of over 42 people now uh, actually spend time at an, in a nutshell um, curating people's or, or customers' listings uh, to really help them with conversions and help them with scale with their business, with translations, listing optimization, uh, and, and all of the above. So, um, you know, her team and herself are really focused on uh, understanding Amazon, understanding the platform, uh, and, and really bringing that expertise to us as sellers to help us with our number one goal, which is obviously scaling uh, and, and converting more, more users. So super excited to jump in there. jana has got a lot of experience with uh, e-commerce uh, in general, she worked for as a business developer for a Danish uh, e-commerce platform for many years. Uh, and most importantly, um, she's just a go-getter in the space. She gets out there. She's always at conferences. She's meeting with the biggest thought leaders in the Amazon space, literally on a, on a weekly basis um, and, and connecting with a lot of influencers and, and really people who are thinking above and beyond within the space. So uh, a lot of knowledge there not only that she has, but uh, knowledge that she has from speaking to other, uh, other um, experts. So uh, yeah, we can jump in. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear what you're hearing in the space. And, and I really want to cover two topics with you. One, uh, at a high level, uh, the big question, which is, hey, I have this amazing product that I've launched in a marketplace on Amazon. And, and how, do I, how do I scale that business? And, and there's two ways, really. One is to launch more products in the same marketplace. And the other one is obviously uh, to look outside of the current marketplace you're in uh, and take it uh, glo uh, globally and, and, and the pros and cons of doing that. And, and I'm really interested to hear your opinions and have a deeper conversation on that. Uh, and then the second piece is, is culturally, um, what, what do we see that's different in, in, in all the various Amazon marketplaces around the world and, and how to really connect with those customers? Because, you know, that's a really key question we have is, how do we better connect with those customers, which will obviously help us with conversion and scale. So uh, two big chunky topics there that we can cover and anyth anything in between. Um, so yeah, well, welcome again. And uh, yeah, let's, let's dive into it. Yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> cool. Okay, so let's, let's start with the first one, right? Which is um, this question, and, and I'm sure it comes up so many times at, at conferences or even with your customers, which is, hey, I have this product. Um, you know, how do, what's the best way for me to scale that? Should I just launch more products? Uh, or, you know, if I do take it globally, what's the pros and cons of doing that? Now, obviously the answer is you can do both, right? But there's definitely a, a focus thing and, and, a, and a, you know, something that, that you would need to basically, you know, which one should you focus on first? Um, but I think to answer that, the most important thing is to understand what do you feel are the pros and cons around taking your product to other marketplaces? Right. Um, so it really also depends if you are, let's, let's say we're talking about U.S. sellers only uh, because the sellers in the U.K. or German sellers, they, always, they love to expand internationally because they're already in Europe and their companies are already registered there and their stock is over there. So that's basically, you know, it's an easy game for them when compared to the U.S. sellers. So U.S. sellers are a little bit of a tough nut to break because everybody wants to sell in the U.S. market. It is the biggest market out there and it gives you a lot of opportunities a lot of uh, things that are just you know beta tested or maybe you know available only like in the US such as like things with like a seventh bullet and stuff like that they were like always first to test on the US market so you get a little bit of an edge um, uh, when it comes to like new stuff and new new testings when you're a US seller but the thing is that if you are happy with your US sales um, and if you maybe think that you can scale your business more but you don't know what to do um, what, what else to do like you have a lot of competitors 
editors, your PPC clicks are very expensive and you just, you know, maybe you're a seven figure figure seller and you just, you know, you don't see yourself getting to that eight figures and scaling even more because of all of these, you know, elements which are causing you problems. And I think that this is the best time when you think that you can maybe go abroad and actually get ahead of your competitors. Because I think that US sellers don't think about expansion into Europe or other international markets the same way as the uh, UK sellers or European sellers. And um, I think they can scale really, really fast once they just decide to go there and to just like mentally decide that, okay, we're doing this, let's do it. And let's focus on some new marketplaces. Usually the, the, the sellers that approach us, they're usually like successful US sellers. They're not beginners. And I would never recommend like a beginner would maybe like uh, two parent products and like three variations of products. You just like also start in Europe. I think you should focus first on the, your home, um, home marketplace and then like expand to others. Um, but if you are a seller that has for instance, like 20 products and you're doing really good, but you're wondering like, what else could I do for my business? I don't have any ideas like left for the U S market. Um, let me just kind of start thinking about some other marketplaces. It might be Mexico. It might be, you know, Canada or, uh, even Japanese market uh, doesn't have to be like a European marketplace, but I think definitely uh, this is the time when you can actually um, start thinking like of the expansion. And uh, this is actually what it, what you can do to uh, get ahead of your competitors. Uh, I was really surprised by talking, um, as you said, you know, I, I go to, um, different conferences, I talk to different people, I love networking, because this is how you actually find new information, you know, like in the exchange experiences. And a lot of US sellers, they haven't even, you know, thought of like typing their product on, let's say a German market or some other market and seeing like how many competitors they have over there, or is maybe this product something which is not being sold in Europe, but has a really good potential or on some other marketplaces. And I just think this is something which uh, you should definitely do in order to check, you know, maybe you are going to have a better potential somewhere else than on the US market, definitely. And I don't think it's, it's a, such a, a big mishap if you're not doing so well in the US market, because we've had a lot of sellers succeed immensely on the European marketplaces and even increase their revenue more than they have earned on the U.S. soil, uh, let alone, you know. So I just think it's a very good opportunity for people to just really uh, use that full potential of their products. And it's not that difficult or painful as it sounds, you know, to um, go to the pan-European or Mexican or Japanese market is a little bit specific. We can talk about this later, but um, it, ha it has also a very, very big potential. Um, it is the third uh, world world's marketplace out there, so. Yeah, no, great. I think th th there's a bunch there that we can we can unpack. Um, I think um, to back this up for a second um, and 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 dive into specific things that you covered there. Um, you know, one thing that that audiences need to consider is is first off, where are they in their life cycle, right? And I think to your point, um, the early on you are in your life cycle, um, you know, when you when you're starting to hit maybe that um, you know thirty forty thousand a month. Or, or you know, starting to yeah. get up towards like the 50, 60, um, and you're looking for for expansion. Probably your advice, and, and I would agree with this, is is you know focus initially on expanding your your range within your current marketplace. I think from a capital perspective, and and even from a risk diversific diversification perspective, really growing your your range of products to a certain level it is probably the first thing to focus on. Um, I also just wanted to add that I really think that a mistake that people are doing when like wanting to go to expansion to this or that marketplace is they don't have a business plan. Mm -hmm. So I just really think that you have to have a business plan in your long term and short term, you know, goals. And, you know, like you have to have that sorted out before you start doing something, because if you don't plan this ahead the proper way, you're going to lose a lot of time and money and it's going to go, you know, the way you did not plan it to go. So, yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. And, and I think to add to that, and this is from my own personal experience of, 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 of going to, to international markets is uh, part of your business plan is resourcing, right? And, and you have to fundamentally understand that um, launching in another market, it brings a lot of opportunity, but it also, um, you know, it, it brings a, a diversification of your focus, right? And you've got to yeah. resource that correctly because it's, um, you know, it's, it's um, inventory, um, management, right? Sending it to different marketplaces. It's capital. It's 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 um, you know focusing on 
your um, your your listings in various markets and 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 curating them for every single market, right? Which which we can yeah, because you don't want to be you know left like uh, without stock and everything. You don't want to be you know surprised and caught by like how well your product is doing, and then when you're left out of stock, this is you know uh, this is very embarrassing. You know, it like just takes forever to get back in the saddle, and uh, something like that also happened to a lot of our clients. Uh, I also pulled up a case study from our from one of our clients. Um, for, for, for the episode today. And this is exactly what happened to him because they were not believing that, you know, translations and PPC campaigns and like good use of keywords could actually lead to their, their, their stock being completely empty, which of course affected the growth, like revenue and everything. So I would say that, you know, if you do your stuff right, you should always think that you're going to go out of stock and this is what your, you know, mindset should be. You know? Yeah. So absolutely hundred percent. So, you know, I, I think again, that that's, that's resourcing and making sure you have the team in place because um, if you're going to do something, you need to do it properly, right? And so making sure you have the capital and the actual resourcing um, setup to be able to handle another market is, is key. Um, and then, uh, you know, to your, to your point, um, the, the fundamental questions we ask ourselves, let's say if we're based in the US market, we're going, we want to go to Europe is number one, how do we do that? How do we navigate actually launching a product on that market? Um, and, and, you know, the taxes and, and everything else that go with, with launching it there, what's the best way to navigate that? Um, and then two, what is the actual opportunity, right? Because a product might not be doing well in, uh, or as well in the, in the US, it might be competitive, but the opportunity in uh, the international markets is much higher um, or vice versa, where it's doing really well in the US, but maybe culturally it's not a good fit over there. So getting answers to those questions I think are the two key things. So what's your, what's your advice on, on, or, or, or feedback on those two key things, which is one, uh, what are the key steps to, to actually bringing that business to Europe, for example, and, and maybe some pitfalls around that. And then number two, um, you know, uh, is there, a, is there a way to validate whether that product is actually worth taking to that market before you take it? Right. So when it comes to international markets and the products, like I would say, if you want to start selling, so in Europe, like the G German market is the biggest definitely market. And it's a, uh, it's bigger than the UK market, which is a, because it's a common misconception. And mm -hmm. then right after German is the Japanese market. So Japanese and UK are kind of, you know, the same level, I'd say, but the J Japanese market is definitely the least searched one uh, with the biggest potential. I'd say that. Um, so it, it would need a completely different uh, research method. I would say if you would, want to sell on the German market and on the Japanese market because it's completely different and uh, your your success of your product also depends on the cultural differences of those nations and the country and what they like so um, a product uh, let's say um, travel mug uh, it might be successful in the German market, but it probably would not be successful on the Japanese market if it doesn't have any neon colors, bunny ears, little birds, bees, and stuff like that. You know, it has to be like a cute, childish, little bit weird, but, you know, still, you know, uh, be, for most of people to, to be able to use it. You know, it's like something like that. So it's quite tricky for the Japanese market, but like for the German market, usually, usually um, a lot of categories, and I think we've done like, I think every single category of products for European markets is that mostly what is your best seller in the US market is going to work on the German market. And um, the reason to that as well is because I like to call the German market as a five star market because um, those countries which don't have Amazon marketplaces, these customers, they are uh, transferred to buy, to, to buy from the uh, German Amazon actually so you don't get only like the access to the germans you get access to like rest of the europe which does not have uh, its own uh, amazon marketplace which is a lot of countries uh, there are basically six uh, now seven uh, marketplaces and uh, but all the rest of your like um, whole scandinavia uh, all the, those people are uh, their lifestyle is pretty, uh, pretty high. And, uh, you know, like other countries, they are uh, forced to buy from the German Amazon. So they have to access to a lot of different sellers. That's interesting. Um, uh, yeah. just, just on that point. Um, so essentially what you're saying is, is countries outside of the main ones, which is UK, German, Germany, France, Spain, um, you know, Scandinavian countries, etc. maybe a few Eastern European countries, they're buying from the German place market, yeah. not from the UK. Um, no, the, the wow, that's one. interesting. And yeah. so, are the listings mostly 
um, they're just translating it uh, to their, their, their local language using Google Translate? Or yeah, yeah, they're just uh, automatically translate depending on your location. They're just like automatically translated, which is pretty bad because yeah. um, Amazon launched pet service. It was pretty bad. I mean, you know, like if you have Amazon and free in one sentence, you know that something's not right. So that's actually, you know, exactly what it was. And I think that Google Translate would have done a better job than Amazon Launchpad. So I don't know what sort of software they were using, but it was very, very bad. And uh, I mean, it did not do any good to any of the sellers. They just, you know, they just, uh, it was really, it was really sad that people use Launchpad during that, you know, honeymoon period that Amazon gives you. And this is how they kind of wasted and blew so much money and time uh, without being ranked for good keywords and like without having a decent listing. And you don't want to have a listing which resembles, uh, you know, Chinese sellers listings, uh, which is exactly how this looked like. So um, I'm yeah. happy that they canceled the service because it was like there were so many complaints about that. Uh, so yeah. So what, so what? So if someone, let's say, someone's in Norway right now, um, they're going to the German Amazon marketplace. Are they um, going to that listing and then uh, it's obviously written in in German uh, and then they're just translating it to. Uh, Norwegian or, or what are they actually or in English? Yeah, or? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they have Norwegian in their list of languages, but I think it's definitely then translated to English. But it's definitely not left in German. Just de depending on your location, your IP address, it adjusts uh, to uh, to that, like what country you are from, and sometimes you can choose language, which language yeah. you would like okay. to see your listing in. But basically, that's a uh, yeah. It can be also a little bit hurtful for your listing because you know the person reading that. Is not going to have that, you know, true, you know, uh, storytelling you want to, you know, give to your customer. Uh, yeah, yeah, but basically, so, yeah. Yeah, and I think we, we uh, let's dive into that cultural um, part in a second. I want to go back to to first that opportunity of going to um, a separate uh, marketplace uh, and and importantly um, validating that that opportunity, right? And I think uh, one of the key things to to really do before you go into marketplace is is use a tool like Songuru, for example, where you can look at the various marketplaces and you can understand based on that product keyword, um, you know, what is the actual uh, sales volume, competition, demand, right? And if you can, if you can understand that, and, and then importantly, what results you're actually set, seeing on the first page, to your point, a travel mug that you're going to see in the German marketplace and what you're selling well is going to be very different to a travel mug that you're seeing on the Japanese marketplace. So using tools to assess that first and seeing the opportunity and making sure you can validate that before you then decide, okay, let's take this product there uh, is, is an important step. And, and we're lucky enough now these days to have the tools that, that can help you with that. So um, that would be my first piece of advice is make sure you do the real homework around what it takes to resource taking it to another market. What is the actual opportunity? And then third, um, and this is a really important piece. And that's why I think you have to be at a certain level for your business is making sure you contract with the right expert experts when taking a market uh, a product. To yeah, market. definitely. Oh, I would just it. add one more thing, and that is the PPC cost, because yes. that's also very important. Because like maybe you have fewer competitors, but the PPC cost is you know very high. Uh, on the Japanese market, PPC cost is literally like. 60% less than anywhere else on any other marketplace. Uh, so that's something, you know, might be very interesting for people when deciding what, what uh, marketplace you should start on. Also in the German market, a lot of uh, products, uh, they have like lower, um, lower PPC rate. So I think that's also something that you should, um, up, up, of course, uh, with the keyword research using tools such as Zonguru and similar ones, uh, I think you should combine the two. So like the search volume you get plus the PPC cost. I think mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's something which would be a good guideline for you. Is it worth it or not? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's where, um, you know, services like what you guys have is really important is, you know, there's that book by Seth Godin called The Dip, right? And, and it's an entrepreneurial book. It's, if, if you haven't, if anybody hasn't read it, they should read it. But what he talks about is whenever you take on a new venture, you're going to go through a dip, right? But if you're going to, and by dip, I mean, it's, it's, it's a learning process. You know, there's going to be struggles. You're going to figure things out, but right. you go into that process with the mentality of like, I need to be the best in that space. Uh, you're going to get through that dip and you're going to excel at the end of it. And I think, you know, we have to approach that with that mentality when going to a, another marketplace is make sure that you can uh, bring on the right team to deliver absolutely the best. Because if you don't, 
um, most likely it's going to fail and, and you're going to lose a, a bunch of money and a, and a bunch of time. So, yeah. uh, you know, be at the right level. I would say my advice based on my experience is be at a level with your Amazon business where if you go to Europe and you, you, let's say you're in the US and you go to Europe, make sure that you have uh, a virtual assistant or a resource that you can put solely focused on that business outside of yourself, um, you know, that can do the day to day on that. And then secondly, that you bring in the right um, expertise uh, for that marketplace for example, um, something like some, something like you guys. So, um, yeah, and definitely if you don't that, try like, to do it. Don't try to do it yourself, especially yeah. if that's the language you don't speak. A lot of people do that, and a lot of people, you know, just end up doing like miserable job with the Google Translate, and then giving that word list to their Filipino VAs, and that that doesn't, you know, end well. Yeah. And nothing is too expensive as your own, you know, mistakes that you did yourself. And I think that it's easier to pay someone, at least in the beginning, to sort your, you know, your headaches, uh, especially when it comes to VATs and company registrations and stuff like that. There are people who do that. Um, uh, I can also recommend a lot of really good agencies for that, whom we work with. And I think, you know, you can save yourself a lot of hassle and it's not necessarily going to be super expensive. Yeah. And, and yeah, you, the upside is a little bit of spend here can, can literally forex whatever you would have done by yourself, you know, yeah, or, exactly. or even more. So, so, so it's absolutely worthwhile doing. And so again, you have to be at the right level. Um, the other interesting thing, just, just, you know, really talking about emerging markets like Australia um, as an Amazon business, you know, they're, they're an emerging market in terms of size and where they are with their, their marketplace. Um, but the important thing there is, you know, if you look back on, on Amazon five, six years ago, a lot of our, a lot of the, the, the thoughts that we have as sellers is like, Oh, I wish I just launched the product back then because you know, I would have had like, uh, I would have actually, you know, cornered a marketplace or a product idea and actually, um, yeah. you know, put a stake in the ground. And so I do give that advice, especially with Australia is like, yeah, the sales might not be that high, but if you're first to market, that's a massive place to be in. You, you actually uh, can own a, a section of the market. So as it grows, your sales will go up. So, for example, Absolutely. This is also, this yeah. is also what I well, what I was also given advice about because um, in we just I just wrote a blog about it on a web page about the Dutch market. Um, mm -hmm. It's the newest market in Europe and it's a small marketplace and there's like this marketplace called Bowl, which is like the base, base uh, main marketplace uh, for for uh, for the Netherlands. But since October, we've got so many inquiries for this new marketplace that was insane. And I haven't expected like so much interest because it has just recently launched. But like an Amazon inside information was that, you know, in, in October, they started, you know, the, the saying that they're going to launch another European market is going to be awesome. And I think we've done like over 300 aces on the Dutch market. Um, uh, it, it's still not visible for customers, but it's going to be, you know, but it's, uh, it has launched launch definitely on January the 17th but uh, there are so many people who want to uh, be the first ones on that market because I think a lot of people see the full potential like being the first is actually very important it might be pretty small now but I think a lot of people see the the, the potential of the market and I think in 2020 it's going to be very interesting to see how this market grows and you know how how successful will the sellers be um, on this marketplace um, I think that a lot of people think that this is going to be a very big hit for them and uh, according from our experience uh, I, I was really you know shocked by like how many sellers approached us and asked us about the Dutch marketplace and Dutch you know translations and stuff like that yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, and, and sometimes you've got to think of it like real estate. It's a land grab, right? And, and if you can be first, right. market, um, you have a massive potential. So, yeah, especially for, for Europeans, you know, that, that's, a, that's an easy, easier jump than, than Americans going into, into yeah. that marketplace. So, so absolutely. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, so let's, let's switch gears a little bit to um, cultural aspects of, of the various marketplaces and and it's obviously a given and i think everyone will, will, will get that here that that you know uh the more your listing is 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 optimized for a specific market and a culture the better chance you have of connecting with that customer the better chance you have of um of of converting right and that goes for images as well as as, as listing copy um, and, and making sure that you understand the culture and, and localizing it for that. I mean, that's any brand 101 stuff. So, you know, but sometimes people absolutely skip on that part and they think, oh, I can just launch something there and it's going to work well. So that, yeah. that's a very important thing. But um, 
you know, more, more from your experience, what are some of the interesting things that are, are different in the way that one should approach, you know, communicating a product or a benefit to various markets, markets, German versus you know, uh, you know, any of the other European markets or, or any other, other global ones. Yeah. What are some of the interesting things that you're seeing there? Yeah, well, I always love comparing the U.S. market with the German market. Um, the German market is, you know, like everybody wants to sell on the German market. Maybe they don't want to go to other marketplaces, but like the German has like it's, you know, it can unlock their full potential. Um, so a very big problem is uh, that people don't understand in how much they should localize their listings. Yeah. That is very important. So let's say U.S. listings have this like... Um, uh, they always have this like sales pitch. It's like buy our product, our amazing, our super cute product. Bye bye bye, our best ever. Like you never felt this way, you know, until you bought our travel mug and stuff like that. Um, and <laughs> a lot of people, your life yeah, everything. gonna change. It's like a life changing moment. Like you're gonna remember this product forever and stuff like that. <laughs> and um, you know, it's fine and it works for the for the for the states. You know, that's that's type of the market, type of the lifestyle of the people and you know it's absolutely great you know i'm just writing my presentation for this conference in la and i have to use that you know i have to change a little bit because i want people there in the audience i want to connect with them uh, easily i don't want to have this like european style because you know america size has like more energy it's like very like come on let's do it and stuff like that and okay. if you just take this u.s listing and that's absolutely true if you take this U.S. listing and let's say you hire like a translator from Fiverr or maybe somebody else that's also like a translator and you just tell them like, look, there's my listing and I want this to be translated for the German market. If you take this U.S. listing with this like amazing, super, super cute product and that you're forcing people to buy the product, you're not going to have a good time on the German uh, marketplace. Uh, people in Germany, they don't want to be pushed into buying products. They don't want to be told how amazing this product is. They will be the judge of that in your reviews. And they really want to have a clear structure and everything's very nicely explained what the product is about. So like, what are the features? Um, what are you know, uh, the qualities, if it's like a makeup product or supplements, what are, you know, what's inside of this product? Is it safe for their babies, you know, for their kids? This is what they want to see in bullets. So they don't want to see any sales pitch in bullets, which usually you see in the US listings. You just, just see like, what are the key features? And is it like nicely explained, like nice and clean design? Like usually they'll start with the like caps on like each bullet. So you can emphasize like the features and then maybe like a, uh, two or three max sentences like explain what did you mean by this feature very clearly understood when translated listings it's all about clearly written descriptions and if people don't understand what they're buying especially in Germany they're hardly unlikely going to buy that product and um, the, the German marketplace is also one of the marketplaces uh, that gives most refunds so this is just like their policy so it's all clean and clear just like their listings and the way of talking to uh, to to customers and buyers actually on that marketplace and I really like the example of of, uh, this was an, an espresso glass cup, uh, glass, yeah, espresso glass. And the US listing of the very same brand says, uh, own the enigma, just like your, I don't know, grandma used to do for you, blah, blah, blah. This is like fourth bullet. And like the second or first, first bullet were just like, keep your fingers cozy and uh, warm just when you like you cuddle in front of a fireplace. That was like a first two bullets. While as the very same product uh, translated in the German marketplace, said for that grandma enigma thing it said thermal isolated glass this is what it says in german so it doesn't keep your finger warm but it says thermal isolated glass which means that you know you're not going to burn your fingers but it's a uh, more plastically and more you know down to earth explained what the material is this cup made of it doesn't make you think what does it mean that you know your grandma used to do i don't know what you know it's yeah, pretty clear and pretty yeah and you know it's like a, and it says and then the first um, a bullet was like elegant and stylish glass that's it no metaphors no like uh nothing that you can remember from your childhood and stuff like that of course it really depends on the product i mean if you're selling a, like a plushy bear toys for your kids sure. of course there's going to be like a little slightly different tone but if you're selling like an espresso glass or travel mug um people don't like to have like this little bit of like, emotional thing it's not what it's like, you know? And we've been also recently um, translating something for a very big uh, payment service provider who's our client. And uh, so one of their brochures, it says, uh, we offer 
humble customer service. And in German, to translate something as humble customer service doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. It's like respectful customer service, like we respect our customers. So sometimes people would not know this, this while translating, but this is exactly what differentiates a really good localized text and something which is just translated from one marketplace, such as like the US marketplace. And it doesn't work, you know, like on the Japanese one, they don't like to have this like emotional attachment to anything. It's more also like a clean like translation, but it has its own perks as every marketplace does. But I would say that from all marketplaces in Europe, the German one is a very, very specific one. And the yeah. one you should pay most attention to um, when it comes to translating from US or UK uh, English text. And usually for the German listings, I would never recommend having like a really long bullet because a lot of the clients, they're like, well, I want to maximize on my 499 characters. Mm -hmm. But I mean, nobody wants to read a novel, like nobody. And you should just, you know, make it visually very nice and clean. And so that people can read like what feature they would find like very interesting. And then in A plus content, you can go to storytelling, like getting pictures and stuff like that, you know, um, choosing the right templates and, you know, and so on. Yeah, I think it's uh, at a high level, it's, it's getting the mix of benefits and product attributes right. And it sounds like, you know, US, it's, you know, it could be like more skewed towards the benefits and obviously covering the, the product attributes, but in the German market, it's definitely product attributes first. And if we need some benefits, fine, we can, we can include that. But um, the product attributes is really what drives it. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And that's definitely the, uh, the German culture. You know, I, I, I remember some friends coming back from Berlin and they were going out to a nightclub and they got all dressed up and, and like the concierge at the hotel stopped them and said, what are you doing? And they're like, well, we're going out. They're like, okay, go back, change, put on yeah, your like, second yeah, yeah. hand, like, you know, dark, <laughs> casual wear. That's cool. What you're doing right now is not cool. You know, <laughs> you're yeah, trying yeah. to hard. So, you know, I think that's definitely a, a, a cultural thing. Um, yeah, definitely. But I think that everybody can, you know, uh, get a grip of like a different cultural, you know, just, you know, I always like to have like a David Hasselhoff is a really good example <laughs> for that. Uh, I mean, of course, we all know about David Hasselhoff, you know, like the Hoff from Baywatch, you know, with the uh, curly locks and like hairy chest, you know, but and he made it big in the States, you know, but his singing career did not make it so big in the States. Yeah. But then, you know, if we look at Germany, um, he was a singing superstar over there. No. Everybody loved him. You know, was it like his leather hosen or something like that? Or, you know, whatever it was, people loved it over there because he kind of, you know, he got customized his product it was failing miserably in the States, but he was a uh, really like, uh, it was a, a bullseye for the German marketplace. And I mean, he was invited to sing at the opening of the Berlin wall. So he was actually part of the um, making a new history for one of the most uh, important uh, European countries, you know? So, you know, I think like if the half can do it, like other people, I'm pretty sure a lot of other people can do it like as easily. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, that's a, that's a good example. Um, awesome. So, uh, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask at, at probably a high level is, is, you know, through all of these conversations you're having with various um, experts and, and, and being connected to the forefront of the trends on Amazon, um, what, what are some of the key important things that you're seeing in the marketplace right now that us as sellers should really pay attention to, um, coming into 2020, um, maybe yeah. just kind of some, some high level thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that a very important thing is to focus on your title. Um, a lot of people were uh, putting brands uh, in, uh, at the beginning of their titles. And recently, things have changed a little bit. And I would always focus like on the title to start with the strongest keyword, always. And to have like at least three or four keywords, but at the very beginning of your title. There were some certain things like at the end of 2019 that the title is going to be shrinked to like 60 or even 70 characters. No matter how big it is, like the first 60 or 70, characters are going to be you know indexed so i was always uh, i would always uh, and when we do the translation this is what we focus on so you put as many as you can at the very beginning of the title and you don't put it at the end or like at the end of a product description and i also think one thing that people really uh, don't pay enough attention to is how their actual title looks on the the mobile app 
because mm -hmm. um, according to uh, the stats, uh, more people buy on Amazon from their cell phones than from their computers. And if your title does not have like something important that you want them to see, but you get those three dots, maybe people are not going to click on the title and uh, or, or on your product. So I think that this is something that people should really, really pay attention to. I get a lot of uh, this, like uh, a lot of people wondering about that, doing the split uh, A-B testing and stuff like that. But I think that um, people should like even pay more attention to the titles because titles are something which definitely gets indexed and you should like put your strongest keywords and everything you think it's very important about your product in your title definitely yeah i want to i want to add to that because I, I think it's it's a really important point uh, and we see that 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 you know the, the further up in the title that your keywords are placed um you know the the, the more um juice it's getting from the algorithm. If you get sales that convert from that, that yeah. keyword, it's going to help you with your ranking. But I, you know, I, I want to expand that further from, from our perspective. I think it's really important to make sure that you research what is the key word that you want to target. And it's not necessarily the, the, the general keyword that drives the most traffic. You have to do a lot of research as a seller, especially in, in more competitive niches is, okay, what is the best keyword for me to target which is a balance between volume, demand, and competition, right? And and, right. and picking the one that you think you could do best with um, that can get you to page one specifically for that one, and then putting that one highest in in your in your uh, title. Because a lot of people are like, okay, well, you know, coffee mug that gets the most traffic. Great, I'll put that first, but um, that might yeah. not be the most relevant for your product, mm -hmm. um, and certainly. Uh, will, will most likely be the most competitive. And so figuring out what is the one that you want to go after and then putting that up in your title is, is a really important um, yeah, I think it, I think I think it's a very big problem because like for instance if you take like nine competitors and you maybe do like a reverse ASIN or something like that you get like and then you do the keyword like for instance we do Excel um, formulas and you said that the Excel formulas are integrated in your tool which is pretty amazing and I'm looking forward to to testing your tool for this is that like a lot of people when they see like that this keyword is like uh, that all nine competitors are ranking for this keyword on page one they definitely want to put it in the key, in the title because well, we have to be also indexed for this keyword and this is how you use like your like you know 10 bytes of your title are used for that and you could have I absolutely agree what you said and you could use something which is like in the, the middle of like between the competitors like is it uh, maybe like four of your competitors are ranked for this keyword but it has like a big search volume so why don't you put that one like in your title so it's not always a good idea to put the the, the keyword that all of your competitors are ranked for mm -hmm. and uh, i would always suggest to you know check the keyword have that balance between your competitors and search volume and just you know, just think a little bit if this is going to be a good idea or not. You know, I would always say yes to, you know, a keyword which is higher in search volume and has less competitors than being ranked for something which absolutely all others are being ranked for. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, really good point. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we're, we're almost out of time for, for this one. And, and I know we could talk for days because there's so much to dive into, but yeah, so much, we'll, so many things. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have you, have you back. And, and, uh, I think, uh, you know, it might even be uh, here in our physical location in, in Los Angeles. Um, but uh, just for fun, I know you, you obviously are a busy person, but uh, what are your next, what, what is your like genius work life hack um, that you use that you love to, to, to go to? Um, and what's your next big uh, adventure? Well, my work hack is actually um, just um, uh, being able to unplug yeah. a little bit and i think that's very very important uh because all of us are very busy and all of us tend to burn out really quickly and the the my the the, the what something which i realize is that i have to just unplug and just like you know uh step back every now and then and just let my brain do nothing and uh, i used to go to musical high school and i play piano like i'd say like a, maybe like an hour or two per week mm -hmm. and while i'm playing the piano my brain just gonna go somewhere else like i don't know where it goes but it goes somewhere and then after i'm done like playing it feels like i've like meditated for for a while because I mean, I love meditation and everything about it, but I just don't think that I can relax enough to meditate more than a couple of minutes a day. And I'm, I was really struggling with that and it was like really getting on my nerves. So I was just like, okay, I have to meditate today. This is what's gonna happen. And then when I don't like, you know, when I can, don't have enough of a, 
uh, the concentration, I would just, you know, give up. But while playing the piano, it's just like something different. I just kind of totally relax, not think about work or anything about life or nothing at all. I just don't remember what I've been doing for that uh, whole uh, hour while I'm playing. So this is something which really, really helps me. And I think uh, everyone should find the way to turn off their brains every now and then because you just come back like very energized. It's like you slept like for 10 hours or something. I really cannot explain that. But this is something which really helped me. And I started doing that like uh, last year. And I just realized I also, uh, again, I, I come to some like, like interesting conclusions. I'm like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Like some uh, like really good ideas come to my mind when I'm playing my piano. Like, I don't know, but that, that's, that's something that works for me very yeah, well. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it's a it's an amazing insight um and i think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with that and and i always say um you know as the leader of your business right um yeah. you have to be able to uh have that thirty thousand foot view and not just be stuck on the day-to-day -day, what's right in front of your feet and in order to have that more of that vision of where your business is going and um you know have that, that bigger perspective you need to decompress and take a step back and actually do nothing because that space yep. to breathe um, and, your, and, and allow your, your brain to breathe, then the bigger ideas float to the top. So um, it's a massive thing that is so important to a growth of any business. So it's a really good insight. So. Absolutely. Like you have to do, just find something that's going to make you so comfortable that you're going to forget about everything. Um, and just, you know, just uh, for, forget about life for that one hour, whatever you do, just forget about everything and just try to focus. It's, it's very hard to do that. But if you find a way to unplug, you are on your way to scale your business. I mean, this yes, is how I go. actually like got some really good ideas and solutions for some of my problems by, by just stepping back and not thinking about them. Like solutions came to me. They don't come all the time, but they do once in a while. So yeah, no, great. When you're here in Los Angeles, uh, I can take you to a place called Unplugged. It's a, it's actually okay. like almost like a yoga studio, but you know, it's it's a place where people go and unplug. It's it's kind of cool. Nice. Definitely good to get away. Um, thank you so much. So so uh, how do how do our audience get hold of you? Um, and and maybe just cover you know what's the best way to to get in touch with you and and what you can offer them. Right. Um, so our web our website is um, YLT, which stands for Your Listing Translations. If in case anybody was wondering, so YLT dash Translations dot com. Uh, we have a live chat over there. Some um, always like there's somebody always online over there. Uh, you can contact us about anything else you're wondering about. Uh, also, we would like to offer free audit of already translated listings. Um, if you guys are wondering why the, why your listings are underperforming or maybe just you know how they could be improved we'll be happy to um, share some advice on that and our email is info at ylt-translations.com so also you can send us an email or come to our live chat and uh, what we offer is basically everything you need to get started on your uh, new marketplace we offer all sorts of translations keyword research uh, so full listing uh, translation we don't have any work limit so the, the price is the same if, even if it's like a plus content or without a plus content we do uh, uh, translations of your ads, follow-up emails, Q and A's, and we offer customer service. Um, we have a subscription plan for this. So how, no, no matter how many comments or questions you get about your products, you can get answers from us in like a couple of hours. You just tell us what you want us to write and we just deliver that in a couple of hours for a ridiculously low price, uh, cheaper than Amazon price per language. You get that for four languages from us. Um, so basically everything you need to get started after, you've, you know, register for VAT and uh, your company, we can provide you with that. Amazing. Yeah, no, definitely um, something worthwhile doing. I can absolutely see the value in, in doing that because it will, as I said, you need to go into marketplaces with having the right experts on your business. And it sounds like you guys have that covered, which is, which is great. So yeah, we only, um, we only have native translators and they do keyword research. And I think that's very important. A lot of times you can have a translator, but if he doesn't do keyword research, but somebody else, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're using the, the right keywords. And the last thing I want to say is please do not translate your U S keywords or UK keywords in Google translate or tell a translator to just translate them to the French language, uh, to the, uh, to 
French market or for, to translate it to German language because it's not necessarily that the same keyword combinations, talking about long tail keyword combinations, are absolutely going to be the same on the German market as they are on the US market. Mm. So just you know, keep that in mind. Great, great point to end on. Um, thank you, Yana, and I'm sure we'll have you back and uh, appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you here in Los Angeles. It's, uh, it's sunny already, so uh, you'll have some good weather when you come over. I can't wait. <laughs> thank you so much, John. Awesome.